Friends, hello there and welcome to our brand new series within the larger teaching series. Uh, for those of you who've been following along, we just finished our Sabbath series and we are now going to launch into a series that is going to carry us through the season of Lent. Now, Lent is a season that prepares us for Resurrection Sunday. So if you are watching this on the release date or during the release week, last week the season of Lent began. So it began on Wednesday of last week, known as Ash Wednesday. And starting with Ash Wednesday, that is day one, Lent lasts 46 days and concludes with Silent Saturday, the day before Easter, the day before Resurrection Sunday. So it's a 46-day experience. Now, some of you have heard about Lent before and you've heard it as a 40-day journey. So you're like, what gives? Well, between Ash Wednesday and Resurrection Sunday, there are six Sundays in between. And those six Sundays are often considered to be like mini Easter's. So they're not counted in the larger reckoning. Hence, 40 days because 46 minus 6 is 40. So for those of you who are like super literal, it's a 46 day experience. For those of you who are like, hey, I can take what I get, I'm fine, then it's a 40 day, however you want to talk about that. But Lent for me has become a really, really significant time of year. And I know, by the way, for some of you, you hear the word Lent and it may just kind of make you feel a little bit uneasy. So maybe you've heard a lot of traditions around Lent or maybe for some of you, you've had bad experiences around Lent. Um, maybe for some of you, you hear the word Lent and it, you're like, I don't even really know what Lent is because maybe, you know, like me, you didn't grow up with Lent and maybe you just heard it from time to time, maybe, you know, in the months of February, March and, you know, April among, you know, maybe Catholic friends or Anglican friends who, you know, talked about giving up something for Lent and that's your only connection to it. Um, that's how it was for me. And so as I started to dig into just the history of Lent, it's like, oh, this is absolutely fascinating and helpful on so many different levels. So um, for many of you, maybe you have some, some baggage connected to Lent. And so let me just kind of give you an idea of how Lent began, because I think this is going to be helpful for us as we navigate through this series. So Lent originally began as a time of preparation for new converts to Christianity. So people who had recently become followers of Jesus, it was customary for them to be baptized on Resurrection Sunday, on Easter Sunday. So it was an intense time of preparation and introspection that then allowed them to experience more fully Resurrection Sunday when they would be baptized and in going under the water be identified with Jesus's death on the cross and then coming out and identifying with Jesus's resurrection with the empty tomb. And so they're brought back to life. And so it was this time of preparation. It was this time of anticipation in order to be baptized. But then over the course of history, followers of Jesus started to say, you know, this is something that would be really significant for all followers of Jesus to do because we always want to celebrate Resurrection Sunday really well. And if we can prepare and if we can anticipate, it just makes the day all that much sweeter. Now, we understand that in connection to Christmas, right? You know, Christmas is December 25th every single year and generally sometime in, maybe if they're like really depraved like September, but like department stores and radio stores, or radios, radio stores and radios, very not true, terrible English all around, right? The radio or department stores or ads come out, you know, in October, Christmas is coming. So we literally have months of time to prep for Christmas. Christmas never sneaks up on us. But Easter almost sneaks up on us every year. I mean, it doesn't have the same date. Last year, 
it was April 1st, right? April Fool's Day, which came with its own interesting connotations. And then this year, it's April 21st, three weeks difference. And so for many of us, you know, we're in the season of spring and anticipating that nice weather will come and all of a sudden we're happy and we show up at church or we show up for our experience and all of a sudden they're like, hey, Easter's next week. And we're like, why? Where did that come from? Like it just sneaks up on us. And so Lent is a way that prevents Easter from sneaking up on us. Because friends, Easter Sunday is the most important day of the entire year. Christmas is important. You can't get to Easter without Christmas. But Christmas is not the most important day of the year. And yet we plan and we prep for it for months in order to celebrate Christmas. And then Easter comes along and it's like, well, it's here and now we're on to the next thing. And so this is why for me, Lent has become so significant, is it allows me to be intentional about my preparation for Resurrection Sunday. And again, I, I didn't grow up with Lent. Um, Lent wasn't part of the tradition that I grew up in. In fact, Lent is, is not just an Anglican or a Catholic thing. It's Eastern Orthodox. Um, Methodists um, will do this as well. So you've got a number of different groups that will celebrate. Lutherans will do it as well. And so it's not just a Catholic thing. It's not just a Lutheran thing. It's not just an Anglican thing. It's a church history thing. And it's a church church history that I think is really helpful, at least it's been really helpful to me, because as I've entered into an intentionality during the Lenten season, I have found that in my story, God often does his most remarkable work in my life during the season of Lent. It's a time where I am aware of things. It's a time where I bring things to God. It's a time where I see God differently and God does something in my heart and in my soul. Uh, and my family and I have been celebrating it for 11 years now. And so, so one of the things that, that I have found with Lent that has been really helpful to help me navigate through the season is to center myself around some kind of a metaphor or an image that I can just keep coming back to as a way of centering myself, as a way of helping me getting closer to God in the midst of the season. And so for me this year, it is the image of bread. And it's an image of bread for a couple of reasons. But one in particular is that I started the year with a 21-day fast. Um, for Lent, oftentimes people fast, and so that's something that's traditionally been part of the Lenten season. Um, but for the church that, that I'm a part of, I'm just a, a congregant at, at a church, at a local church community, is that collectively as a church body, we decided we were going to take the first 21 days of the year and we were going to fast in some way. Um, some people did like an entire fast, like liquid only for 21 days. Some people just fasted from breakfast. Some people fasted maybe just from from, you know, another meal during the day. Some people fasted from certain types of technology. Um, for me, I did my first kind of more extended fast um, where I didn't eat breakfast or lunch and I just had dinner um, because in part, I'm training for a half marathon right now, and I knew that there would be no way that with two Israel trips um, between like now and when the half marathon is that I needed to get every bit of training that I needed. I needed every ounce of energy. And so I knew that that would already be a big stretch for me because I've never done an extended fast before, which feels like really bad to say as someone who was a pastor for more than a decade, but I've always struggled with fasting. Um, I struggle, uh, I struggle a lot with headaches, like if I don't eat. And so if I like miss breakfast, like I just get a horrific headache. And I finally just said, God, I'm, I'm going to join the rest of my community. Uh, it will be a modified fast, but I'm still going to fast from breakfast and lunch. And the idea behind a fast is that when you start getting those hunger pains, it's to be a reminder to you to go in prayer to ask God for certain things or just to be, you know, in conversation with God and ultimately to be reminded how, how utterly dependent we are on things to survive. 
And oftentimes for us, for me at least, I look towards, you know, food as a way of taking care of my needs or drink to take care of my needs or if something comes up to go to the bank account and to be able to write a check or to use my credit card or Apple Pay or, you know, whatever it is in order to take care of these certain types of needs. And so when you limit yourself, you remind yourself that it isn't your bank account. It isn't your intellect. It isn't just the the food you have in your refrigerator or in the pantry or the water that you have in your faucet or the drink that you have in your, your refrigerator and that ultimately sustains you, it's that God is ultimately the sustainer of all things. And so I'm now just coming out of a season where I was just reminded how utterly dependent I am on food. And when you remove that, it gets me back to my relationship with God. And I found that during those 21 days, that I just experienced God in a whole new way. And it just deepened my relationship with Him. It was another type of experience to have with God that I never really had before in this capacity for this length of time. And so bread has become something that has been central to me to think about. And not just bread in general. I'm actually not um, celiac, but I'm, I'm gluten sensitive. So I can't actually even eat bread. So for me, this just symbolizes food in general. But for the season, I am thinking about Lent in terms of bread and being in terms of thinking about how Jesus meets me in my time of need, but just in my daily activities as well. And so one of the things is, is that I've had this imagery of bread coming off the 21 day fast. We're just coming out of our series on the Sabbath where Jesus says this, and we looked at this in detail in one of the episodes, but in Matthew eleven twenty-eight 28 through 30, Jesus says, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. And we talked about this in the context of Jeremiah 6.16, one of these passages that's sitting behind this. But there is another passage that sits behind this, I believe, as well. And this one is from Isaiah 55, verses 1 through 3. Actually, there's more to that context, but these are just the verses I want to read to you. Come, all you who are thirsty, come to the waters. By the way, this is God speaking. And you who have no money, come, buy and eat. Come, buy wine and milk without money um, and without cost. Why spend money on what is not bread and your labor on what does not satisfy? Listen, listen to me and eat what is good and you will delight in the richest of fare. Give ear and come to me. Listen that you may live. So this is a passage where God is like, come, and he's talking about water, and he's talking about bread, and he says, why spend your money on bread that's not really bread? And so God is talking about bread, but he's getting to a deeper reality. And I believe that this is why Jesus in John 6, 35, and this is going to be our anchoring passage for this series, is that Jesus said, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. That at this very critical moment in Jesus' ministry, he just makes this bold proclamation. He says, I am the bread of life. And so Jesus takes something that everybody can understand, bread, and he says it's about bread, but it's actually about something that's much deeper. And by the way, this isn't the first time that this happens in the scriptures where bread is used from more of a metaphor perspective or from an analogous perspective. We see this in Deuteronomy 8.3, where Moses is speaking and he says to the people about God, he humbled you causing you to hunger and then feeding you with manna, which neither you nor your ancestors had known, to teach you that man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. So he says he's talking about does not live on bread alone, but from every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. And so it's not just about bread and God provided manna in the desert for the Israelites during their 40 years. And Moses goes, listen, this wasn't just about talking about you survive on bread alone. It's about the word of God. It's about God's presence, about God being part of your life, that that's where your sustenance lies. 
And I believe all of this and so much more is wrapped up in Jesus saying, I am the bread of life. He takes something that is so rudimentary, the basic you know, thing that keeps us alive, food and water. And Jesus says, that is me. I am the bread of life. And so with all of that in mind, I've just entitled this series, Bread of Life. And what I want to do over the next several weeks, taking us to the Tuesday right after Resurrection Sunday, is to look at the stories in the Gospels where Jesus is utilizing bread to teach us something so much more than just bread. And that my hope for us in this Lenten season, that as we work through those teachings, as we think about Jesus being the bread of life, as bread being this image that we center ourselves around during this Lenten season, that we really ask a basic fundamental question, and that is where do we turn for our source of sustenance? In fact, just this teaching is called Bread of Life Part 1, Source of Sustenance, because it's something that we need to be confronted on up front. Because we can say, well, I turn to God, but is that really, in fact, the truth? Or do we only turn to God in part? How much do we lean on ourselves to provide for our needs? Now, that isn't to say don't be irresponsible, right? I mean, we ought to be good stewards of what God has given us and that what God has given us, we should use to solve problems, to figure out needs and all of that. So I'm not saying that we just don't do anything. We abrogate all responsibility. We put our hands down and we say, well, I'm going to come to God. He better do something about it. But to really, really center ourselves in and ask ourselves, where do do we turn first and foremost for our source of sustenance? Is it our bank accounts? Is it our intellect? Is it the opportunity that we have in front of us? Is it, you know, something else? And we go, you know what? In this season, God, I need you to reveal to me where am I not really leaning into you? Where am I putting too much of an onus on myself? Not putting an onus on myself, because again, we do this in partnership with God, but sometimes I think we do too much and we think that we are the answer to our circumstances. And we need to trust and rely on God. And this is a season that reminds us that we have to die to ourselves, that we have to die to certain things in order to be fully alive to Christ. And so where do we turn to for our source of substance? And, and if we can say, I turn to Christ, this is, this is who I'm about, then I also think that on the heels of that, how can we draw closer to Jesus in this season? Like, what specifically can we be doing to make this a reality that he is the source of our sustenance? What is it that we can do that we we don't do the rest of the year or that we can be very intentional upon? Um, You know, is there something that we can do on a daily basis or something that we do every single week that we don't do the rest of the year that allows us to draw closer to Jesus and that as we spend time and as we enter deeply into that, that we start to remember and we're reminded about how he is the bread of life and he is the source of our sustenance and that he's providing for us in ways that we haven't necessarily experienced because we haven't allowed him to or we haven't opened ourselves up from a place of vulnerability to allow him to do that work inside of us. And then I'll just finally just end with this, is that where do we need to hear from Jesus in this season? That for many of us, we're going through a tough time, we're struggling with something, and I go, man, I really want to say that Jesus is the source of my sustenance, and I am really, really struggling. And I would just say, take this to God, to say, Jesus, in this season, here's where I need to hear from you, to go to someone who knows you and loves you, let them know what you're going through, and say, will you pray for me just during this intense? intensified preparation towards Resurrection Sunday, this Lenten season, 
that Jesus would meet me anew, that Jesus would speak to me anew, that I would hear from him anew to know how I'm supposed to navigate my journey going forward. And I believe that when we do this, when we answer these questions, when we enter into these rhythms, when we pray these kinds of prayers, that we recognize that Jesus is the source of our sustenance and we allow him to be the nourishing, fulfilling bread of life in our lives. So friends, we're going to dig in deep. We're going to start next week with the feeding of the 5,000. And we're going to look at this story in context. You're going to see things you've never seen before. And it's going to challenge us not only next week, but in every single week. How do we draw closer to the bread of life? So thanks for watching. Thanks for listening. And may you walk out this Lenten season well in your life. 